it's another pretty much review video, but maybe with some new perspectives about the dot product. I'm going to go pretty quickly through stuff. I want to go, I want to start with a problem. What is the angle between the two vectors? Let's say u is 2, 1 and b equals 1, 3. Now, I need to make a notational aside, and it's actually a little more than a notational aside. In the Stewart book, he uses angle brackets when he's talking about vectors, as opposed to parentheses, round brackets, when he's talking about points. And let me just talk briefly about that. If I have a point, 2 comma 1, We denote that with the round parentheses. That's just the point in the plane. But in order to get the power of vector algebra going, we very often promote that to be a vector by putting the vector in standard position, that is, with its tail at the origin. And then that gets transmuted into the vector 2, 1. And the way you translate back and forth is if I have a vector in standard position with certain components, then the, te the tip of that guy, the head of the arrow, is exactly at the same coordinates. The components of this vector are the coordinates of the point. And vice versa, if you have a point, you can promote it to being a vector in this way. So the reason we do that is we have immense thing power we have with vector algebra, and especially once we get the dot product and other things like the cross product. We want to have a uniform way of talking about that. Not have some things be points, some things be vectors. So almost always, we're just going to take points, we're going to promote them immediately to be vectors and then work with them as vectors. But it is a little artificial because of we're choosing the base point to the origin. And often the origin is a little bit um, arbitrary. So that's something I wanted to mention in terms of the notation and the idea of points versus vectors. If, it gets, if, if there's any place where it really gets subtle and confusing, I'll try to make sure to, to address it. So anyway, here I really care about the vectors because they really are directions. They're rays, really, that I care about. What's the angle between those directions defined by those vectors? Well, that's actually a hard problem. That would be a very hard geometry problem because I want an angle. That's kind of a you know, 9th to 10th grade geometry kind of problem. But I'm giving you stuff in coordinates. That's kind of an analytic geometry way to express the information. And it's amazing that we have actually a pretty cool and simple way to answer this question. What we do is we find one operation that has a nice formula in terms of, of geometry, so it has geometric significance, but also has a formula in terms of algebra, and in fact, an easy, really easy formula to calculate in terms of algebra. And that is the dot product. Okay. So how do it, does one actually do this problem? The claim, and I'm just going to put this out as a claim, and you can read in the book for proofs, and I might do a video more about the, the, the background stuff here is that we can define an operation called the dot product u dot v of two vectors in two different ways. That's what's really useful about it. It's not so much in each of the, the different ways it's useful. It's the two different ways. So what are the different ways? One is you just take the first components of u and, and, and multiply them together, second components u and v, and multiply them together, and then add the result. Notice, this is not the vector u1, v1, comma, u2, v2. It does not mean create a vector 2, comma, 3. This is not useful to us. You might do this like on a spreadsheet or something, but it's not geometrically significant. You never, ever are going to do this in this class. But if you take these two numbers and you add them in, you get a scalar. In fact, in fact, another synonym for the dot product is a scalar product. That it actually does have a geometric meaning. It's not obvious, but it does. Here's where we, it acquires its power. It turns out that's the same as if you took the magnitude of u, the magnitude of v, and multiplied by the cosine of the angle between them. The fact that these two numbers are equal is anything but obvious. And the proof in the book involves like the law of cosines. It's pretty cool, and I might do a video about it. But let's take for granted for a sec that somebody's really carefully proved that this algebraic formula, which is easy to calculate from components, 
is equal to this geometric formula, which has geometric information. OK, that's exactly what we need for a problem like this. Because here, u dot b is just 2 plus 3, which is equal to 5. And so I have this. Now, can I calculate these guys? Oh, yeah, these have algebraic formulas too. This is something that we knew how to do both geometrically and algebraically. But it means the length of that, that arrow, but it's also given by a Pythagoras formula. So we've got 5 equals the square root of 2 squared plus 1 squared, so that's 5. Square root of 3, 1 squared plus 3 squared, so that's 10. Um, times cosine theta. And so we get 5 equals, uh, now we're in luck here. That's, there's actually a, this is a 2 root 5, and so the root 5's cancel. Uh, or they become a 5. 5's cancel, and I get cosine theta is 1 half. And I'm very lucky, because that's actually a theta I know. In general, we'd have to do an inverse cosine here. But we actually know that the angle whose cosine is 1 half is equal to pi over 3, or if we prefer 60 degrees. Since we're doing geometry, it's not immoral to use degrees. If we were doing like circular motion, it would be. And so it turns out this is none other than a 60 degree angle. Usually this number is not going to work out so nicely, but I picked, I picked one that, that we worked out very, in a very pretty way. So, here, again, to recap, we were trying to find this geometrical quantity because it goes into the geometric formula for the dot product, and that also is given by the algebraic formula. We were able to do this, and this, and this, just using algebra, and then solve for cosine theta, and then solve for theta. So that's a, one of the places where um, we're going to use the dot product. So the, the way to summarize that in a master formula. If you're actually focusing on the angle, there's this formula that's in the text, which is, I think they use A and B, but it doesn't really matter. You take the dot product of two quantities and you divide by the magnitudes of those two guys, you're going to get the angle between them. Notice, if either of these vectors is zero, so the length is zero, this doesn't make any sense, but of course not. If one of these vectors is a zero vector, it doesn't define a direction, there's no way to get the angle. The other thing to notice is that Suppose I doubled the vector u. Suppose I had actually had a vector u that was way long like that instead of this guy. It shouldn't change the angle. And that's what we're seeing here. If you double u, well, what's that going to do? It's going to put, it's going to double this and double this. So it's going to double the dot product. So this is going to go up by a factor of two. But then that's going to go up by factors two as well. If you double a vector, you double its length. And so that's going to stay the same. Similarly, if I triple v or multiply v by any fixed constant, that's going to cancel out. And so it has to have this kind of shape. In particular, we couldn't possibly have this be the right formula, because this does depend on the length of u and the length of v. If I double u, I do double their product. If I double v, I do double their product. So that's going to be a really nice formula in itself. And let, let's pull some consequences out of this that are going to be really important for us, really important. And that is, what about we want to think more about this quantity, mu dot b. It gives us some clues as to its meaning. Let me check the time I got here. All right, let me go just a little bit more on this one. Maybe switch to another one in a minute. What's the meaning of this? Well, it's a real number. And the simplest thing you can ask about a real number is whether it's positive, negative, or zero. And let's see, well, what happens? Is there anything special about the dot product of two vectors being zero? Well, you bet there is. That's when this quantity is going to be zero. And therefore, cosine theta is going to be zero. Now, to be real careful, this is going to happen if either of the vectors is zero. But let's hold on off on that for a second. Let's just assume they're non-zero for a second. We'll see it works out. That's going to happen when cosine theta equals 0, or in other words, when theta is pi over 2, or if you like, 90 degrees. Or in other words, when u is 
perpendicular to the other. When two vectors are perpendicular, that's exactly when their dot product is zero. And the fancy word we use in this context often is orthogonal. Uh, there's various historical reasons why we don't say perpendicular. But if you say perpendicular, it won't, it won't kill anybody. But that's the word we're often going to use here. But it means perpendicular vectors. And um, let's go back to that special case, u and v, one of them equal to zero, both of them equal to zero. What we're going to just agree to say is that the zero vector is orthogonal to everything. It feels a little weird that one vector could be orthogonal to every direction. But hey, the zero vector is pretty special and weird, so it's okay. Um, and so we're going to say zero is orthogonal to everything, including itself. But for non-zero vectors, it means exactly what you think it means. It means that it's a right angle. So that's very interesting. Okay. Now, what about positive or negative? Let's go over here. U dot V is positive. That's when cosine theta is positive. Notice that these guys aren't doing anything interesting. This is positive times positive. It's never going to change the sign. So these guys always have the same sign. So that's going to be when theta is less than 90 degrees. As we know from our unit circle, that that's when the cosine of an angle is positive. So this means that the vectors are generally, not exactly, in the same direction. One thing I like to say is it, it turns out that a lot of the times, these guys, we might be adding these vectors. One of the things we might be doing with these vectors is adding them, as well as comparing their angle and, and comparing what directions they go in. If I add these guys, they're going to tend to help each other. That's where this is positive. And you can probably guess what I'm going to say next. When it's negative, that's when cosine theta is negative, and that's when theta is greater than 90 degrees. That's going to be the obtuse case. That's when, if I do add these two guys together, or I think of them as, as a unit, they're kind of hurting each other. They're they tend to oppose each other. And the extreme case of that, the biggest negative dot product I can get as I kind of unfold this angle is when they're in the opposite directions. So that's going to be, for a given magnitude of u and a given magnitude of v, it's going to be the biggest negative dot product I can get. Now certainly, if I just make u bigger or v bigger, I can make the dot product as big as I want, positive or negative. But if I fix u and v, and I just vary the angle between them, I'm going to get as strong a positive number as I ever get here, when cosine theta is 1, I'm going to get 0, and I'm going to get as big a negative number as I ever get when they're opposite to each other. And that's a really important thing to know about the, the dynamics of the dot product. Again, it's not obvious. None of that's obvious from this definition. And it's certainly even less obvious when you go to three dimensions. And this is one of the beautiful things about the dot product. If you do three-dimensional geometry, using sort of Euclidean methods, uh, it's much harder than two-dimensional geometry. But if you use things like the dot product, then you just switch from this formula to this formula. It's not much harder. It's the same Lin theory we've been having in linear algebra. Working in 17 dimensions just means more variables. It doesn't mean any different process, any different kinds of calculations. It just means more quantity of calculations, not qualitatively different. So that's a good place to stop. Uh, with this video and I think I'll do one more.